Hello fellow YouTubers! In this episode, we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of repairing a Phase Linear 400 Series 2. Years ago when I got this amplifier, it had blown fuses. I never had time to repair it. So let's get into it. We can start by disassembling the amplifier. Make sure the amplifier is unplugged and remove the screws from the back of the rack handles as this removes the faceplate. Next, remove the three screws on each side of the chassis, six total to detach the VU meter volume control panel. Lay the meter panel face down. In a minute, we'll put it on top of the heat sinks. Now remove the two 5 16 hex nut screws that attach the control board. Carefully pull the control board from the standoffs and lay flat, part side down. The first thing I look for is physical damage. On the right channel, the right side of the amplifier, we have three damaged resistors. This picture shows the two-watt emitter resistor on the third output transistor on the far right bank. But also, the emitter of output number two transistor is burnt. Connected to the base of that same transistor is a charred 10 ohm, one half watt resistor with the other end connected to the emitter of the driver transistor of that bank. The next thing I do is test my digital voltmeter in the ohm setting by shorting the test leads to make sure it is reading properly. Note the tenth of an ohm resistance. That is test lead resistance and is normal. In the phase linear 400 series 2, there are 12 output transistors. My amplifier is quasi-complementary, meaning it uses the same type of transistor on each side of the power supply rails. The rail is about plus or minus 81 volts and is fused at 8 amps per rail. This amplifier uses 12 NPN transistors, all with the same part number. The left channel is on the left side of the amp and has two vertical banks of output transistors, three in each bank. The bottom set of transistors are the drivers that feed the outputs, one per bank for a total of four transistors in each vertical bank. There are two banks per channel, each bank being fed by each side of the power supply rail. The right channel follows the same pattern. Let's take a look for any bad output transistors. We do that by connecting an ohmmeter to the collector and emitter of each output. The negative side of the meter will connect to the collector and the positive side connects to the emitter. We are looking for a very low value indicating that there is a shorted output on that bank. Make sure the 8 amp power supply rail fuses are pulled. Why you may ask? Because if a transistor is shorted on the other bank which is connected to the other side of the power supply rail, you would be looking at the output winding of the transformer and you'll see a low resistance on your own meter which would make it difficult to see a shorted output transistor. Also, make sure the power supply capacitors are discharged and nothing is connected to the speaker terminal. The collectors of the output transistors in a bank are tied together forming a bus bar. So we can keep the negative side of the ohm meter connected to that bus bar and then use the positive probe of the meter to connect to each emitter. Let's start at the top of the far left bank which we'll call bank number one and number one output transistor on the left channel. As you see, we have 164,000 ohms which is not a hard short. Moving on to output number two on the left bank, we have 165,000 ohms. Output number three has 166,000 ohms. So bank number one has no shorted output transistors. Let's go to output number one of bank two. We have 185,000 ohms. Output number two, we have 186,000 ohms. And output number three also has 186,000 ohms. So there are no shorted transistors on the left channel. Now, let's go to the right channel, which is on the right side of the amp, and look at those six output transistors. 
Starting with bank number one, transistor one, as you can see, we have a 1.2 ohm short. Is this transistor bad? Let's take a minute to explain. When you look at the schematic, you can see that all three transistors in that bank have .33 ohm resistors that are connected from their emitters to a common bus bar. If one of the other two transistors are shorted, that short goes through its .33 ohm resistor to the common bus, and if you are measuring a different output than the one that is shorted, then you are not only measuring the short of the other output transistor, but you are seeing its .33 ohm resistor and your resistor as well. The resistance of a shorted output will be usually less than 1 ohm. We have 1.2 ohms, so the shorted transistor is most probably not this one. Let's move on to output number 2. Okay, so here we have a very hard short, .2 ohms. Let's take a look at output number 3, 1.1 ohm. Again, as in the case of output number 1, I would call this output transistor good. In bank number 3, output transistor 2 is bad and will have to be replaced. I measured the emitter resistors in that bank and they are .5 ohms or half an ohm. These are 10% tolerance resistors, so adding .033 to each .33 ohm resistor, you get .363. Taking into account our 0.1 ohm test lead resistance that we measured from the start, that allows for a maximum of .463 ohms, close enough for our half ohm measurement. If you add the two .5 ohm resistors and the .2 ohm short of output number 2, you get 1.2 ohms. This is very close to those measurements we took on outputs 1 and 3. Hopefully you now understand what we are looking for when tracing a shorted output in a bank. Going to bank number two, our last bank on the right channel, I found two shorted output transistors, number two and three. I also checked the emitter resistors and both two and three are open. You can see the damage in this picture of what happened to those resistors. As you can see, the 10 ohm resistor connected to the driver transistor was fried. I wondered why this happened, so I took a look at the schematic. That resistor is connected from the negative side of the power supply rail to the bus that connects the base of output transistor number 3 that was shorted in that bank. As you can see on the schematic, the output is on the negative side of the power supply rail and output number 2 on bank 1 is shorted on the positive side. The emitter resistors to transistors 2 and 3 on bank 2 were open. Basically that allowed the rail current to go across that 10 ohm resistor. No wonder it fried. This normally does not happen. I believe the output transistor shorted, blew the rail fuse, and someone replaced the rail fuses with possibly higher capacity fuses. This in turn burned up the output emitter resistors, allowing a current across that 10 ohm resistor. Obviously, that is not a good idea. Just replacing fuses can cause further damage to the amplifier if something is wrong with it. Here is a look at the physical damage inside one of those output transistors. Now when it comes to these green labeled transistors, I do not have any phase linear transistors. I do not mix devices. Why? Because each brand has different characteristics and it is essential all transistors in each bank share the load equally for reliability of the amplifier. So I will replace all the transistors with Motorola MJ21196G devices. Also check to make sure that the transistors you use are genuine. There are counterfeits out there and there is info on the internet on how to identify these. I bought mine from Mauser and that company guarantees them to be real. Let's pull all the output transistors. Concerning the output emitter resistors, since I have to replace two of them, I will replace all emitter resistors including the 10 ohm resistor connected to the emitter of the driver of the right channel, bank number 2. We will start by removing all the old ones. Then we will solder in the new ones and then clip off the excess lead length. I also checked all the driver transistors the same way I checked the outputs. Emitter to collector and they are all fined. As I mentioned, 
All output transistors in a bank need to share equal load or current. It is best practice to group transistors in a bank with similar characteristics to achieve that. We can measure those characteristics with a transistor checker and group ones with close characteristics together. Granted, this is not the best way to do that, but along with a current sharing test we'll do in a later video, it'll work. I am in the process of building what I call a Wheatstone bridge for comparing transistors. I found a circuit on the internet. I redesigned it so the match on R1 and R2 can be calibrated. And also I added a switch to be able to test not only NPN transistors, but also PNP. The parts are on order and I'm awaiting delivery. We have a lot of phase linear repairs and upgrades, and after I build this tester, I will further explain the principles behind this Wheatstone bridge. In the meantime, my transistor tester will have to do. With my current transistor tester, we will be looking at the HFE or current gain of these transistors and will be grouping ones together that are similar. The standard I will be using is 5% tolerance. I have three packs of Motorola MJ21196G transistors consisting of 12 transistors in each pack. I numbered each transistor on the case for reference. I also have already tested a pack of 12. Let's take a look. Number 1 in this pack has a gain of 58. Number 2 also has a gain of 58. Fast forwarding to number 6, we have a gain of 68. Number 7 has a gain of 62. You get the idea. Now as far as grouping similar ones together with the 5% tolerance I mentioned, here is what I came up with. For the left channel bank number 1, output number 1 has a gain of 70, number 2 has a gain of 69, and number 3 has a gain of 70, well within that 5% tolerance. Bank number 2 of the same channel, we have for output number 1 a gain of 77, number 2 75, and 3 70. This is not as tight a tolerance of bank number one, but is still within spec. I did this to be able to utilize all the transistors I purchased for future projects. Going to bank number one of the right channel, I have a gain of 66 for output number one, 66 for number two, and 67 for output number three. Bank number two of the right channel, I have 62 for output number one, 61 for number 2, and 59 for output number 3. We now have our transistors chosen for each bank. Let's go ahead and install them. I cleaned the heat sinks before I started. Always use new silicon insulators when replacing transistors. They are inexpensive and not worth the hassle and the further expense of repairing an amplifier due to being a cheapskate. Also, make sure you put the insulators on right. As you can see on the left channel, bank number 1, output number 3 was wrong, and also output number 2 on bank 2 was wrong. I noticed this before putting the screws in and corrected. The lesson? Take your time. Do not hurry. Be careful with the 5 16 inch mounting screws. You might want to turn them counterclockwise first to make sure they are seated properly. You do not want to cross thread them. Also, do not over tighten them. Just a good snug after you feel resistance. This takes a feel, but I have been doing this since I was a kid. I usually go back and forth between the two as I'm snugging them up. Here is a picture of all the transistors installed. Pretty, isn't it? Let's take a look at those output transistors again. No shorts. Here is a picture of the back plane after I replaced the resistors. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe. On the next episode, we'll get into the testing and the tune-up of this amplifier. Well, that's a wrap. We'll see you in the next episode.